pages after our entire doctrine, and I was able to go over it in just three services and tell you everything we believe. The entire doctrine. All right? It's simple. It is simple for a reason. Because the Bible is the ultimate authority, and these 16 points come out of this word. They come out of the word of God, and, and this is what leads us and directs us. You know, I was listening to, in, in, my, uh, in my personal time, I was listening to a podcast the other day, because I have pastors that speak into my life through podcasts, and, and they were talking about, they were talking about people complaining about the conservative church uh, worshiping the Bible, all right? And here's the reason why the liberal side of the church, and yes, there is a conservative side of the church and a liberal side of the church. Wake up. Wake up. The liberal side of the church wants to take huge pieces of this Bible and black them out or cross them out or tear them out and say that the word doesn't matter. What God says doesn't matter. And they accuse the conservative side of the church, that's us as assembly of God, of worshiping this. So I got a quick question for you. Do we worship this? No. You better be because what is this? And who's the word? God. Jesus. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was, was with God and the word was God. So do we worship this? Absolutely. Because it is, it is God. It is the word. And you have to understand that it is infallible and absolute truth. Absolute truth. Because it is what sets the standard for everything else. And as soon as you start ignoring that or crossing it out or saying, I don't know about this part, or I don't quite believe that part, or I, I, I don't know, I think God might have been missing it here. Or, Look, when they wrote this, this was thousands of years ago. We, we, we've gotten smarter since then. We've matured since then. We've become enlightened since then. These are the arguments that go on. God's clear about that. There's nothing new under the sun. And it's the same old mess going over and over and over again. Same old mess. There's nothing new. But we have to understand that and understand the authority of that word because that word is absolute truth. Absolute truth. And we can use it, use it to teach, to correct, to rebuke. The word has power. It can even save. The word can save. Man, you, we have got to grasp that as a body of believers. And understand the ultimate authority of the word. And understand that the word, Jesus, is worthy to be worshipped. And everything in there is him. Because he is the word. So, this is where we as a body of believers have to understand what is going on. And have to make sure we're grasping absolute truth in what the word of God says. How did Satan tempt Jesus? By twisting the word. By taking the word out of context. By making the word say something it doesn't say. And that's what's going on right before our eyes, guys. That's what a huge chunk of the body of Christ is doing. It's twisting the word. It's taking it out of context. And it's using it to forward an agenda that is straight from the pits of hell. Straight from the pits of hell. And as the body of Christ, you need to use that word to renew your mind to be able to see the attacks of the enemy that's going on. Because they're going on all around. So next week, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to know when you're under a spiritual attack or when Satan's messing with you. And you're going to want to be here. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to just tell you how, how it happens. I'm going to tell you what to do about it. What to do about it. So that you can, above all, stand. See, here's the amazing thing about when we stand. Who fights the fight when we stand? God. God. All he asks us to do is stand. If we will stand, he will come to our aid and fight the fight. We just need to stand in faith. That's all he asks. And when we do that, he fights the so I'm excited about next week in case you put it down. But <laughs> we're finishing up this series this week. And I'm excited about this week too because we're going to talk about eternity.
And this is my favorite subject. I love talking about end times and eternity. So we're going to hit that with these final fundamental truths. But I'm going to give you just a real quick review. We're going to go through this very quickly. It was the first two parts of the series. It's on Facebook Live. You want to go back and catch it. But um, we started this uh, journey three weeks ago with part one. And in part one, we covered the first five fundamental truths. The first one is the scripture is inspired. It is God breathed, the inerrancy of the word. The word is absolute truth. The second one was one true God who reveals himself as the great I am, the great I am. We talked about that. Um, and then we talked about the Trinity, which is a which is a a, a term given by man for God in the Godhead and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Holy Spirit, all right? And, and we've had people argue with us, I'm sure you have, the Trinity's not in the Bible. It isn't. It's a man's way of describing what God is. A triune God, same way we're a triune being, three parts, all right? So we talked about that, and he reveals himself as the great I am, the great I am. And then number three, we talked about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully God and fully man. All right? He is two in one, two in one, fully God and fully man. And we acknowledge his deity and the fact that, that he is God. I and I and the Father are one. That's exactly what Jesus said. So he either is who he says he is or he's a liar. Can't have it both ways. We believe he is who he says he is. He is who he says he is. All right? And then number four, the fall of man uh, in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. In Genesis 2 and 3, talks about the fall of man. Um, and we emphasize the fact that man was created good. Man was created good. When God completed creation, he looked at all creation and said it was very good. Very good. So we talk about the fact man was created good, but because of free will, man had fallen. He fallen. And because of that fall, original sin entered in, and that's what's passed on. That is the sin nature that is passed on from person to person to person to person to person. All right? Um, and we are in a fallen state from the moment, moment we are born. And we even talked about David who says we're in a fallen state in the womb. He says we're in a fallen state in the womb. All right? So we talked about that. Then we talked about salvation of man. Uh, number five, fundamental truth five, the salvation of man. So Jesus is our propitiation. He is the all-sufficient sacrifice that he has reconciled us back to God the Father. And there is no longer enmity between God and man. There is no longer enmity between God and man when you are in Christ Jesus. That's the key. When you are in Christ Jesus. And then number six, we talk about the ordinance of the church, which is water baptism and communion. Water baptism is full immersion, as example in the Bible. It's an outward showing of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a cleansing, a cleansing of you to enter into your priestly service. Yes, each and every one of you are a priest. You are a priest in the ministry of reconciliation. We are a kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom of priests. So that's what the church is. And that's preparation for your priestly duty. And then we talk about communion and that we are to celebrate communion until he returns. Until he returns. There's a prophetic aspect to it. Um, and then number seven, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is commanded. It is the second gift from God. The first gift is salvation. The second gift is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that when you receive the baptism of this Holy Spirit, you receive power to be able to act on the authority that's given to you in salvation. So when you are saved, you receive authority from Christ, but you don't have the ability to act on that authority. You don't have the power. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive that power. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can't take on the death. You cannot. You cannot. You have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to enter into spiritual warfare and to have victory over Satan. You have to. Because it is the power of God in you that enables you to have that victory. All right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Uh, number eight, the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is tongues, the ability to speak in tongues. 
We talked about the three types of tongues mentioned in the Bible. Your prayer language, that's for everybody. Everybody should have a prayer language of tongues and be able to pray in the Spirit and edify yourself and build yourself up. Second type of tongues is the gift of tongues, which is a prophetic utterance in tongues, a heavenly language, and an interpretation of tongues. That's another gift. So, so those are the second type of tongues that's talked about. And then the third type is the deep groanings, the deep groanings of the Holy Spirit. When you are crying out to the Lord and you are not able to articulate words, the Spirit will pray for you and these deep groanings will come out of your mouth. And we talked a lot about that when we looked at Musla. All right? So those are the three basic types of tongues talked about in the Bible. Um, then we talked about number nine, sanctification, becoming Christ-like, that we, we are not instantaneously sanctified at, at salvation, we have positional righteousness, but we do not have progressive righteousness. We are to be molded and formed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is sanctification. It is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong journey. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are able to become Christ-like. That you are able to become Christ-like. So, you are positionally made righteous or sanctified because of the blood of Jesus, but then you're supposed to go on this journey as a believer. And as a believer, you are supposed to change and become like Jesus Christ. Become like Jesus Christ. So that's sanctification. Then number 10, the church and its mission. church has four basic missions that are lined out in the scripture. The first is evangelism, to win the lost. The second is to worship as a body of believers like we did this morning. The third is discipleship, to be equipped to go out and win the lost, to be equipped to go out and do the works that God prepared for you in advance to do. And then the last one is to show God's love and compassion to the world. And that's part I opened up for. We're supposed to be showing the world heaven, showing the world heaven, and showing the world God, not just in these four walls, outside of us, every day of our lives. We're supposed to be letting our light shine. And then um, the next one was number 11, the ministry. Um, and God gives the church the ministry as laid out in Ephesians 4 to lead the church. That's the five-fold ministry, the apostle, uh, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Christ gave that ministry to the church to help the church fulfill the full four, four-fold mission he gave the church. So that's the leadership that Christ established in this church, or in any church, to help the church to complete its mission, to complete its mission. And then we talk about divine healing. Lastly, number 12, divine healing. It is part of the atonement, the word sozo, uh, or salvation. It's, it's a package deal that includes much, much more than getting to go to heaven. By his stripes, we have been healed happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. So we are already here. We just need to walk out that healing in faith. And that brings us to number 13. I bet you didn't think I'd be able to do that review that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I should get an answer. Yeah, All right. All right. So we are on number 13, which is our blessed hope. Our blessed hope. So we're into the end times. All right. And, and, and the first one we're going to start out with is our blessed hope. The resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in Christ. I'm going to stop right there for a second and talk about this. Because there's a lot of confusion in the church about the term Paul uses to sleep in the Lord or to fall asleep in Christ. He uses it in several of his letters. And, and, and there is a group of, of theologians who believe that this means you go into a dormant state when you die. And you just kind of lay in the grave asleep until Christ comes back. That is absolutely false and not true. How many know that, Pastor Sean? Because the Word of God says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul made it clear. You're in one of two places. You're here in your body, or you are in the presence of Jesus Christ. Those are the only two places you can be. When you are in the presence of Jesus Christ, you are there at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the first judgment. First judgment. The judgment seat of Christ. And that's where it would be determined if you go to heaven or hell. If you go to heaven or hell. 
If you hear, well done, my, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in, or you hear, depart from me. But you won't hear one of those two things. One of those two things. And that is the first judgment that takes place. But I want everybody to be absolutely clear about this. There is no dormant state for a believer. You're not laying in your grave waiting for Jesus to come back. You are in his presence as a spirit, as a spirit. All right? So I just wanted to address that because there, there, there is some confusion over this when people are reading it in their Bible. What are you sleeping from? Why does Paul say that you are asleep? You are sleeping or resting would be a better translation. You are resting from your work. What is your work? Win the loss. Do you need to win the loss if you're in heaven? No, everybody's won already. Do you need to win the loss if you're in hell? No, there's no hope. Because this is the determining place. This is where it's decided where you go. There is no second chance. So you are resting from your work of winning the loss. All right? So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about sleeping or resting in the Lord. It's from this work here on this earth that you were commanded to do. Hopefully you're doing it. Hopefully you're doing it so you can hear, well, that might be a faithful servant. Because I'm telling you, I don't want to hear, well, I guess I'll let you squeak in. You got some blood on you. I guess you'll make it. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, well done, that I've completed the task laid before me by the Lord. Each and every one of us has a task. God has given us work to complete. And we want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. Enter in. So that's our desire. So I just wanted to hit on that for a second. So um, for those who fall asleep in Christ, and their translation together with those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord is the uh, eminent and blessed hope of the church. This is talking about the rapture. This is talking about the rapture, all right? And that the church is going to be raptured, and we will spend eternity with God. That is our blessed hope. We should know that we know that we know that we are saved. We're going to be taken out of here and raptured. And if we die before that rapture happens, we will be in the presence of the Lord. And we will be the first to receive these resurrected glorified bodies we're going to talk about in a moment. All right? So this is our blessed hope that we will have this body that is perfect and we will spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. That is our blessed hope. That's something to be excited about, isn't it? Yeah. Woo! That's something to be excited about. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel in the trumpet call of God. This is one of the last trumpet calls, guys. This is the last trumpet. At the very end of it all, that last trumpet is going to call, and Christ is going to come back. He is going to come back. And the dead in Christ will rise first. As everybody in heaven will be with him and will see these resurrected, glorified bodies. All right? Your resurrected bodies. They will rise first. And after that, uh, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. This is the people who are on the earth at the end, at the end of the tribulation, that are born again believers. All right? So. This is the rapture. We already talked about that. And the word rapture, just like the word uh, trinity, is not in the Bible. It's a man-made term given for the catching up of the saints. All right? And it's always called the catching up in the Bible, the catching up. So we've given that a term and we call it the rapture. But it's specifically talking about that phrase in the Bible, catching up, catching up. All right? So it means you're going to be taken out and pulled up into heaven. Now, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture for the church. He's going to pull his church out first. The scriptures are very clear about that. His elect will not have to suffer through it, is what the word of God says. Who's his elect? Us. Us. We're not going to have to suffer through it. But, once it happens, and everybody looks around and says, where did everybody go? Why am I still here? And some of you sitting in the pews will be saying, where did everybody go? Why am I still sitting here? I'm just telling you that's what the Word of God says. That's what the Word of God says. That, that, that when this rapture occurs, it is only the elect 
those who are truly born again, that are going to be raptured out. And there's going to be people who thought they were okay, and they're going to realize they weren't. They weren't. They were never really born again. All right? And they're going to be left behind, and they're going to say, I missed it. I missed it. Well, guess what? They got the first half of the tribulation to get born again. Because in the first half of the tribulation, which is a seven-year period of time, in that first three and a half years, people will be born again here on the earth. As a matter of fact, in Israel, 144,000 are going to get born again. And, and, and they, are, they are numbered in, in the end time book of Revelation. It talks about that. But there's going to be many, 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 many more people who are going to turn to the Lord and be saved in the first half of the tribulation. And a lot of them are going to get martyred in the tribulation. A lot of them are going to die. But not all of them. Some of them make it through all the way to the end. All the way to the end. They're marked by the Holy Spirit and they are protected. They do not take the mark of the beast. And they make it all the way to the very end. And those are the individuals that it talks about that will be changed in an instant from, from um, um, this earthly body into their heavenly body. That they will be changed in an instant. That the perishable, this body, will be made imperishable in an instant. And they will be changed at the very end of the tribulation. That's a second rapture that takes place at the end of the tribulation. And the Bible is very clear about it. It's very clear about it. Why do they have to be changed? Because you can't enter into the next part or timeline of the Bible, which is the millennial reign, in a perishable body. You, as a born-again believer, will not enter into the millennial reign in a perishable body. All right? So who's alive in the millennial reign? Because it's clear, according to the Word of God, people are alive. A lot of speculation about that. To be quite honest, we don't know. We don't know who's alive. But there's babies and there's people alive. It is not any of the people, none of the people, who lived through the tribulation that were not born again. It is not. All right? It is clear in, in the book of Zephaniah that no one will survive the day of the Lord's wrath. That's exactly what it says. No one will survive the day of the Lord's wrath. So the ones who are believers and make it through will be raptured and translated immediately in their resurrected glorified body, and everybody else is wiped out. Everybody else is wiped out. But there are babies in the millennial reign, and we don't really know where they come from. There's speculation, there's theological thought, there's a lot of debate over it, but we don't know, and it's okay we don't know, all right? It's okay, guys. All right? It's okay to say you don't know something about the Word of God. Especially in Western culture, we all want absolute truth. We all want it all tied up and put in a neat bow and say this is it. And it doesn't work that way. There's things God reveals to us, and then there's things he gives us indications of that we don't know in full. That's what Paul talks about when he says, we're now looking through a glass that's cloudy. Someday we will see in full. Someday, now I know in part, someday I will know in full and fully understand. And that's okay. We just need to get over that. All right? Even most of the end time stuff, I love one of the pastors that I listen to occasionally on podcasts. He, he, when he gets questioned about the end time, he always says, I don't really know about that when he doesn't know. And then people will say, well, what do you mean you don't know? And he says his response, I love it. He says, I'm on the welcome committee. I'm not on the planning committee. I'm not planning his return. I'm here to welcome him. That's my responsibility. I'm part of the welcoming committee, and I'm going to make sure I'm right with the Lord, and I am here to welcome him when he comes back. Because that's my responsibility as the body of Christ. We're going to be here to welcome him in as he takes over and sets up his throne. All right? That's our responsibility. We're not on the planning committee. God is, and he's already planned it all out. And the parts of it he wants to reveal to us have been revealed. The rest of it is just speculation. It's just speculation. And sometimes God gives us insight when we pray and meditate and dwell on things. God will give us glimpses of it and show us parts of it. And we may have a revelation of what's going on. And that's the awesome thing about the Word of God. It is living and it is alive. And when we pray over it and we seek Him about our questions, He'll be faithful and answer that. He'll be faithful and answer that. But as far as thus saith the Lord, there is very little about the end times, guys. I don't know how much there is. There's two chapters in the book of Revelation and a couple verses here and there in prophecy. That's it. That's it. <coughs> About eternity in the very end. 
the very end. There's very little about it. All right? Now, about everything that's going to take place in the end, there's a ton. It's almost a quarter of your Bible. About the war of Armageddon, the war of Gog and Magog, what's going to happen during the tribulation, what's going to happen. All that is clearly laid out to the second coming of Christ. And then when we get into the millennial reign of Christ and eternity, there's just a little wee bit. There's just a little bit, enough to give us a glimpse of what it's going to be like. But I can tell you this from the glimpse, you don't want to miss it. You do not want to miss it. All right, so we're on the rack of the church right now, and we're on verse 17. After that, we are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's us going up to meet Jesus as he's coming back, and we're still on this earth. And so we will be with the Lord forever, forever. This is that perishable being changed into imperishable. Your perishable body in this fallen state cannot go with the Lord into eternity. You cannot. You cannot. You will have to have a new body. If you want to survive, you want to need a new body. And that's a good thing because that body won't be perfect. It's not going to be a mess like the body we have now, right? It's going to be perfect. Going to be perfect without sin, without sickness, without disease, without issue. You're going to have a perfect body, and that is our blessed hope. That is our blessed hope. Number thirteen, number fourteen, the millennial reign of Christ. Number fourteen, the millennial reign of Christ. This is the next thing that takes place. The second coming of Jesus Christ includes the rapture of the saints, which is our blessed hope. Number thirteen, we just talked about. Fundamental truth thirteen. It starts out with that statement, but then it gets into fundamental truth 14, which is the millennial reign, followed by the visible return of Christ with his saints to reign on the earth for 1,000 years. Who's the saints? Us. Us. That word saint, we are all saints. It's not some hocus pocus thing like some denominations do. We are all saints. That simply means we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's just a shortening of the word sanctified. We are his saints. And when he comes back in the millennial reign, we will be with him and will be um, part of what's going on here on the earth. Part of what's going on here on the earth. All right? There's a couple key points underneath this uh, that the Assembly of God points out. Number one is the millennial reign will bring about salvation of the nation of Israel. And he lays out the scriptures for that. God's promise to Israel will be fulfilled. God's promise to Israel will be fulfilled. God promised Israel this promised land, and they have never taken possession of the full amount of land. God said he'd be with them, he'd fight with them, and they didn't complete the task of taking the entire promised land. As a matter of fact, what is, what is Israel today, and what was Israel in King David's time, was just a sliver, a fraction of what should have been the nation of Israel. And this will be totally given to Israel during the millennial reign. And it goes from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Tigris and Euphrates River, all right, which is modern-day Iraq, Baghdad. And then it goes north from Syria all the way through the Arabian Peninsula, all the way down through what is now Saudi Arabia, all the way to the tip of it. All that land, which is a lot of land, was promised by God to Abraham. It was the promise to Abraham. And then his descendants would occupy that land. That promise will be fulfilled during the millennial reign. And, and the, the Jews will occupy that land. So unless you are a Jew, you're not going to be in that land. We will be everywhere else on the earth. We will be everywhere else on the earth. The Gentiles. All right? But they will receive their promised land. David's throne will be reestablished, and David will sit on it as a prince. As a prince. Why is he a prince? Because there's only one king in the millennial reign. Who is the king? Jesus. Jesus is the king, and he will rule and reign. But there will be people put in places of authority around the world to help govern the world in the millennial reign. David is one of them, and he will sit on a throne as a prince. There's the 24 elders that were also occupied his throne. All right? So there will be people on the earth that will be helping Christ to govern everybody that's going to be on the earth. All right? But 
David's throne will be reestablished, and he will sit on it as prince. That's part of the promise to Israel. All right? And then the last point here, in the establishment of universal peace, Christ will rule and reign with an iron scepter, and there will be peace on earth. There will be no wars. There will be no rumors of war. There will be nothing going on. A matter of fact, the word is very clear. If you, if you get out of line, you're going to be smuggled and taken care of immediately. Immediately. All right? The word is very clear that Christ rules with an iron scepter. That means he doesn't put up with any mess. He doesn't put up with any mess. All right? At this particular time, all evil on the earth has been destroyed. All evil. All the evil and wicked people have been destroyed. And, and the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the fallen angels, and the demons have all been dealt with. There's one left, Satan. One left, Satan. And he is bound in the abyss, or, or in the pit, in the pit, for a thousand years. So that he can no longer tempt man. So that's one awesome thing about the millennial reign for those who are alive in it. They will not be tempted the way we are tempted by demonic spirits. Because there will be no demonic spirits. All right? So there will be peace all over the earth at this point in time. Um, but God's final enemy, um, death has not been dealt with yet. So there is death during the millennial reign. As a matter of fact, the, the Bible clearly states that if you only live 100 years in the millennial reign, you will be considered a curse. You will be considered a curse. That means you did something wrong and you died. All right? But you're supposed to live through the whole thousand years of the millennial reign. That's the way it's going to be. All right? For those who are alive, that's the way it's going to be. And again, who are those who are alive? We don't really know. We don't really know. The Bible really doesn't spell out who those individuals are. But they're going to be there. Then at the end of the millennial reign, Satan is let loose. And he, there's a period of time, we don't know how long it is, but it's going to take some time. He, he deludes those who are on the earth and deceives them and raises this massive army and marches on Jerusalem to destroy Christ. This is the final battle. And then God the Father intercedes and steps in, and he wipes them out and wipes all evil out. And that's when we enter into eternity. That's when we enter into eternity. So there's this final purge of evil from the world. Final purge of evil from the world. So that is the millennial reign in a nutshell. Um, and again, there's very little scripturally on it. You can see some of the references there if you're interested in it. And there are some great books on it if you would like to, to know what they are. Come and see me and I can point you in that direction if you want to do some more end time stuff. All right? And then number 15, the final judgment. Number 15, the final judgment. Let me get my slides bumped up. The final judgment. And it says, this fundamental truth, number 15, there will be a final judgment in which the wicked dead will be rise and judged according to their works. They will be judged according to their works, what they did while they were here on this earth. Their works. Whoever is not found written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life must be written in it to be saved. Your name can be blotted out of it. The psalmist talks about that. Do not blot my name out of the Lamb's book of life. It can be removed from it. We believe you can lose your salvation. The scripture clearly states that and points that out. But in the end, when you stand at the first judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to ask you, have you accepted me as Lord and Savior? For those of us, those of us who were born in the church age, that's the question he's going to ask you. Have you accepted me as Lord and Savior? And you're going to say yes or no. And if the answer is no, then you're going to say depart from me. If the answer is yes, he's going to say enter in. And your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Lamb's Book of Life. All right? So, that's the first judgment. This is the second judgment, the final judgment. And it's called the Great White Throne of Judgment in the Bible. Together with the devil... Uh, whoever's name is not found written in the book of life together with the devil and his angels and the beast and the false prophets will be consigned to everlasting punishment in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. The second death. Guys, make no mistake about this, 
this lake, according to Psalms 37:20 and uh, Isaiah 47:14, it is an all-consuming fire in this lake. It is an all-consuming fire in this lake. It is constantly called the second death. That's in Revelation 20:14. Also, besides here uh, in this bullet point, and um, Hebrews 10:31 says that we are to fear Him who can destroy both body and soul. When is body and soul destroyed? When you are thrown into the lake of fire. All right? It is an all-consuming fire. And final punishment or judgment will be to be thrown into that lake of fire. That's what will happen. Hell will be emptied out. They will all stand before the great white throne of judgment. The books will be opened. The Bible talks about the books that are being recorded on your life. There are scribes up there in heaven writing down everything you did. One of my favorite books that's talked about in the Bible is the book of hidden secrets. Solomon talks about it. And it's the book that records all the stuff you're doing when you think nobody's watching or nobody's looking. And if that isn't covered by the blood of Jesus, you will be judged by that. Because God is a just judge. And he's going to show you the books. You're going to say, well, I think I was good enough. I think I should. I spent a little time and hell and did my punishment. I think I'm good enough. I should be able to go in. And he's going to start reading from the books. And you're going to feel like the worm you are. That's what's going to happen. This is a big issue in the church today. Because the majority of the church has no concept of what they're being saved from. What you are being saved from, they're walking around saying, I'm saved, I'm born again. And they don't understand that what they are being saved from is this final judgment. Eternal separation from God. That's what they are being saved from. They're being saved from their sins, which are condemning them. And they have no concept or understanding of that. There's a false gospel being preached right now about salvation, and it has overtaken the overwhelming majority of the church, and there is never any preaching on repentance and turning away from your sin and living in holiness and righteousness. And there's hardly ever any preaching that, that lays out exactly what you are being saved from. And that God is a just judge, and you will be judged. You will be judged. And we have to understand that as a body of believers. We have to understand that. He demands justice, and his justice is perfection. And the only way to achieve perfection is to receive the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he's the only perfect one that ever lived. He's it. He's the only sinless person that ever walked this earth. And if you don't have the, the righteousness of Christ covering you, you're a filthy bag. You're a filthy bag. I don't care how much money you gave to what you gave to, or how good you think you are, or how, how you just did a little bit of bad stuff. I, none of that matters. The Word of God is very clear. If you break the least little tittle of the law, you've broken it all and are guilty of God. And are guilty of God. So we need to understand that as a body of believers. So this final judgment is going to take place. It is the second death. This is the, the uh, resurrection of the dead or the second resurrection. It is not for the living. Who's the living? Us, the saints. It's not for us, guys. It is not for the living. It is only for the dead. So you will never see this judgment. Thank God. Thank God. You will never see this judgment. It is only for the dead. And the result of it is the second death. It is the great white throne of judgment. And the books will be opened. You will be judged. And then you will be thrown into the lake of fire. So that is number 15, the final judgment. And then number 16, the last of the fundamental truths. The new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens plural, new heavens, and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. And again, I told you the new heavens and the new earth, there's very little in the Bible about it. 2 Peter 3, 13, Revelation 21, and Revelation 22, is everything that's contained pretty much in the Word of God about it. It talks about the new Jerusalem that's going to come down, this massive city with, with golden streets and pearly gates, and gates that never close in the walls, and it talks about the foundation made of 12 layers of this 
precious stone, and this is going to be a beautiful place. A beautiful place. And it's going to come down and rest in Jerusalem. It is going to rest on uh, the only mountain that's mentioned in the new heaven and new earth. It says there is one mountain, great and high, with the new Jerusalem on top of it in Revelation 21.10. It also says in Revelation 21.1 that the earth will be recreated and there will be no seas. No seas. It will all be land so that it can hold all of the people that are going to enter into eternity with God. All right? So, if you like the beach, you better go now. If you like the beach, you better go now. Because in eternity, there's going to be a beach. All right? There's not going to be the ocean. So you better get your fill of it now. But it is going to be marvelous. It is going to be marvelous. It says that there will be light all the time, and the city gates will never close. They close the city gates at night to keep the thieves out and everything. There isn't going to be any of that. It will be light all the time. God will provide all the light. And his son Jesus is the lampstand. So the two of them are providing the light. It is daylight all the time. And we will live on this earth. Eternity will be on this earth. And, and you will live in this paradise here on this earth. And I've preached a series on that. Uh, what will heaven be like? Um, probably about a year and a half ago. So if you want to get a hold of that, we can make the copies available for you. Just let me know. And then the last thing, it says in Revelation 21, 4, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things will pass away. The old order of things will pass away. We will enter into eternity, and it will be perfect. It will be perfect. I personally believe this is when we finally lose our sin consciousness. We finally lose our sin consciousness. Because our sin consciousness is still there during the millennial reign. I've had people ask me, when you're in heaven, are you going to remember the people you didn't preach to or didn't share your word with? Or other? And I think, yes, absolutely. How do I know Lazarus is the rich man? The story of Lazarus is the rich man. It's very clear we are going to have uh, knowledge of everything we've done on the earth and what went on, and, and that's still going to be there until we enter eternity. Once we enter eternity, all those things will be taken away. Don't know how, guys. Don't know how that's going to happen. Nobody knows how it's going to happen, but our sin consciousness will finally be removed, and we will enter into eternity with God, and, and at that point, we will not have... Um, any heartache or any pain or, or any crying or any mourning or anything like that. All right? So that's what the Word of God says eternity is going to be like with the new heaven and the new earth. And then to wrap it all up, this is the 16 fundamental truths. Let me get the worship team to come up. This is the 16 fundamental truths. This is the core to our doctrine and our belief system. It is the basis of our faith as the assembly of God. It is 16 points that are bullet points to talk about what we believe as a congregation and a body of believers. It is very, very easily summed up. These are all 16 points on one sheet of paper. The description only takes nine pages. There are denominations where, where their doctrine would fill entire libraries full of books. All right? Ours is very basic because we believe in the inerrancy of this. And this is what guides us. This is what guides us. All right? The Word of God. So, that's the 16 fundamental truths. I hope you guys have enjoyed this journey with me. I hope you have a better understanding of what we believe as a congregation and a body of believers. And um, we're going to let the worship team lead us out and think a little bit about eternity. Make sure our eternal existence is secure. If your eternal existence is not secure, come and see me or Pastor Gary. We would love to talk to you about it um, and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to accept him so that you can enter into eternity with us. Make no mistake, though, guys. If you're not born again, there's one way through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only way, through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you have not been born again, if you have not been born again, you're not going to make it. No matter how good you are. All right? And I want you guys to clearly understand. God wants you to know that you know that you know you are born again. You shouldn't be guessing. If you're sitting in that chair saying, I think so, I hope so, I believe so, 
you are supposed to know something. There's two proofs that are talked about in the Word of God. The first proof is that God speaks to you. He speaks to you. My sheep hear my voice and they obey. God should be speaking to you on a regular basis. Sometimes it's an audible voice. Sometimes it's just the unction of the Holy Spirit, God directing you and, and, and speaking to you in that way. Sometimes it's through this word. When this word goes from logos to written word to rhema, it comes alive. And God speaks to you and something jumps off the page and bears witness to your spirit. And you like, no, it's God revealing it to you. You've read it a hundred times before and all of a sudden he speaks to you and it comes alive. Those are the ways you know God is speaking to you. He is speaking to you. And then in your prayer time, he speaks to you. And then the second way is you change. You change. You have to be changing. I said sanctification. You have to be becoming Christ-like. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. And if you're born again, you have to be changing. And it is a lifelong journey, guys. Nobody changes overnight. Nobody stops sinning totally overnight. But as you progress on this walk, God does this work in you. And all of a sudden, a year later, or two years later, or three years later, you're not the same person you used to be. You look radically different. Your whole life is changing. He wants you to know. If those things are not happening in your life, please talk to God Superior and myself. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to help you understand what it means to be born again. Amen?
Wow. 